And Elder Fred, thank you for your awesome reading. If you would, please open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 34. But there's two other places in the Bible we're going to go to that are Matthew 5 and Matthew 25. So if you want to bookmark any of those, feel free to do that. Ezekiel 34, he is, Ezekiel's a prophet, Old Testament prophet, and God is using him, sharing his words through Ezekiel to the ancient Israelites. And look at all the things that God is promising to do. This is Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11. It says, For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. And then in verse 12, he says, I will rescue them from all places. Verse 13, I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. Verse 14, I will feed them with good pasture. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. The next verse, verse 16, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. Verse 20, God says, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Verse 22, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And in verse 24, he says, I, the Lord, will be their God. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Isn't that amazing? Amazing what the Lord has promised to do with his people. Wouldn't it be foolish to get in his way or to reject what he is offering to us? I mean, I mean, seriously, all these things the Lord has promised to do and has done and will do, wouldn't it be silly if we got in his way or said, no, we want to do it our own way? The Lord promises to seek us out, to rescue us, to feed us, to shepherd, to, to shepherd us, to separate us, to save us. He wants to separate us, his people, from the people that don't want anything to do with them. Ezekiel uses the fat sheep versus the lean sheep or weak sheep. Jesus uses the sheep and the goats. But the Lord promises to save us, and on our journey, the Lord has given us the Bible to tell us what to look for and what to avoid. It would be inconceivable to not refer to this Bible regularly. And I was trying to think of a good example on why you should all read your Bible, and me too, why we should all read our Bible and I came up with an example. So I have an example. I don't know if it's a good example, but it's an example. Pretend your life, you are meant to grow tomatoes. That is your thing. Your life goal is to grow them, and you have the perfect manual on how to grow tomatoes. But because you thought you could do it better on your own, you never looked at it. You refuse to look at it. So you grow. Now, could you eventually grow tomatoes? Yes, but you're going to go through a lot of trial and error. Every season, you're going to learn something different. You're going to learn, okay, well, I, I know now that I shouldn't plant my tomatoes in January. And then you learn another season, you learn, okay, I learned not to plant my tomatoes in shade. I got to put them in the sun. And then you learn, well, I can't underwater my, my tomatoes. I got to make sure they have plenty of water. And then another... As you're doing this trial by air thing, you go, well, maybe I should put something that the tomatoes can grow up in, like a cage or a stake or something. You're learning all these lessons, and you learn, okay, this year I learned some, goods are, some bugs are good, and then some bugs are bad. So you're learning all of these things. By the end of your life, you would have learned a lot of lessons on what to do and what not to do if you would have taken time to have read your excellent tomato manual, you would have avoided a lot, you would have avoided a lot of bumps and bruises and injuries. You would have learned these same lessons early on. You would have had more time enjoying your gardening. You would have had more time enjoying your awesome tomatoes. 
and sharing them with other people, you would have spent less time worrying about why your tomatoes aren't growing and your neighbor's tomatoes are growing. The Bible is God's tomato manual for us. It's his instruction manual. He's got everything in there. He wants you to use this as a resource. He knows you're going to have questions. He knows you're going to have concerns. He knows you're going to trip and fall and bruise yourself and break all kinds of things. He knows this because he knows that life is difficult. He doesn't want you to try to figure out this life by trial and error. So we're going we're gonna to jump to Matthew 5, because some of the things God wants you to learn in this instruction manual, they come, they, they're in the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes means the blessings. But unlike the tomatoes, you cannot learn these things by trial and error. These Beatitudes, these blessings are taught specifically from Jesus. So in Matthew 5, verse 3, I'm going to read these. If you don't have your Bible open, just listen. The, the scriptures were originally spoken. People would just sit and hear. So Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are promises from God. These are blessings from God that you're not going to learn by trial and error. Because these are opposite of what the world wants you to act. The world doesn't want you to be weak. It doesn't want you to show any weakness. It wants you to be strong. Well, that can last for a little while, but not forever. God wants you to live differently than the way the world suggests and promotes and markets to you. This is why he gave us the Holy Scriptures to refer to. So we're going to go, we're going to jump to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46. And these are, these are tough verses, just like Fred had mentioned. So we're going from Matthew 5, these blessings. We're going to jump to Matthew 25, verse 31. We're not going to go verse by verse, but just so you can have it open. This is the second coming of Christ. This is when Jesus Christ returns in all of his glory at the end of the world. And when he comes, he is going to separate those who believe in him, the sheep, from those who reject him, the goats. And I purposely didn't aim at the different rows in here. Because I every time I preach on this, the goats of the sheep, I always do this, and I'm not singling anybody out. I think you're all sheep. That's good. That's good if your pastor thinks you're a sheep. But according to verse 46, the goats will go away into eternal punishment, but the sheep, the righteous, will go to eternal life. And this word eternal, it's the same word in Greek. We cannot, we cannot sugarcoat this. It's exactly what it says. Goats, eternal punishment. Sheep, eternal life. The important question is how do we come righteous because verse 46 says the sheep, the righteous, will go into eternal life. What is this righteousness? St. Paul writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So knowing Jesus Christ Everything else doesn't matter. It's all loss. This is what St. Paul is saying. For Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, as trash, 
in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. We become the righteous only because our sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. We, are, we cannot rely on our own righteousness, how good we can be, how, how awesome we can be. We can only become righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. When God looks at you because Jesus has taken all of your sin on the cross and died for it, when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. You have been robed in his righteousness. You have been covered. You have been cleansed. You have been forgiven. You are righteous in the sight of God, the perfect righteousness. This theme that runs all the way through the Bible is God loves you, and he wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. He is not a hidden God. He wants you to know. He gives you scripture to learn more and more about him, but he doesn't just want to know you. He wants you to be righteous, and so out of his mercy, he has made you righteous because of Christ. Our parable in in Matthew 25 about the sheep and the goats It's all about knowing Jesus. It's all about knowing God's Son who came to earth for you. It's all about who is righteous in God's sight. What God values is much different than what the world values, and we saw that in Matthew 5. Jesus makes it clear. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, For they shall be satisfied, seeking out this righteousness that only God can give, that only God through faith in Christ can give. If you hunger and thirst for your own righteousness, you're going to be satisfied in the here and now. You're going to be comfortable and and happy in this world. If you hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, then this, this is a completely different story. Because once you have this righteousness, your eternal salvation is secured. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Being clothed in Christ's righteousness, your spot in heaven has been secured. Because of this, you worry less about what's going on in the world. And then you start thinking about helping other, other people. The sheep in the parable, they didn't even realize who they were helping. Lord, when did we feed you and clothe you and help you and bind you and and do all these things? When did we welcome you and visit you? Jesus' disciples, they do these things because that's what Jesus' disciples do. They don't keep track of how many people they're helping because they help people all the time. It would be silly to tally every single person, because they're living a life of helping people. Because that's what Christ's people do. Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 25, verse 46, The cursed will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the last Sunday of the church year, the liturgical church year, and it's fitting to take a step back and to look at the bigger picture of God's plan. So we have Christ's first coming. He comes to earth as a little baby in a manger in Bethlehem. He fulfills many of the prophecies throughout the Old Testament in his birth, in his life, in his ministry, in his death and resurrection, That was his first coming. The second coming, Christ is going to to return and fulfill all the remaining prophecies in Scripture. In the first coming, Jesus was the suffering servant. In his second coming, he is going to come as the triumphant king. In the first coming, Jesus arrived in the most humble of circumstances, 
in the second coming, he will be coming with all the armies in heaven. When Christ returns, if at that time you refuse to acknowledge him as Lord, that's your decision. At that time, when you see him coming, it will be too late to say, Lord, I believe in you now. At that time, the door to the party is going to be shut to you. So this is not just about living and dying. This is about heaven and hell. This is about eternal life in the presence of God or eternal punishment in the complete absence of God. I'm going to close. So, Fred, you were right. These are tough, tough scriptures to preach. This is, this is real, and we're not going to shy away from the difficult verses. This is, this is it. There's the goats and the sheep, and there's heaven and there's hell, there's everlasting life, and there's eternal punishment. I'm going to close with one more verse. This is from St. Paul. He makes it absolutely clear what we must do to be saved. And this, this goes for all of your relatives and your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers that you don't think know Christ. This is what they need to know. This is from Romans chapter 10, verse 9. St. Paul writes it very simply. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that simple? That's a simple enough message that we can take anywhere. So we read the Bible, we come to church, we pray, we help others, we do these things to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to keep... We have this manual to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. No one knows when he is going to return. He could be here before the end of our service, which, come Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> he may be here in another hundred years. We don't know. Until that time, we are called to be ready and to stay ready. Scripture will help us to be ready and to stay ready. Now that you know Go tell somebody else. Tell someone else that doesn't know Jesus yet so they can be ready too. Amen.